Good morning all, bonjour tout le monde. My name is Mark Romoff and I'm president and CEO of the Canadian Council for Public-Private Partnerships. And it's a real pleasure uh, for the council to be co-presenting today's webinar with the Canada Infrastructure Bank. I'm here, as many of you know, in the city of Toronto. So at the outset, I wanted to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississauga of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat peoples, and also we're home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. And as is clear from the more than 500 people that are registered uh, to join us today, this webinar is a very timely event, both as an opportunity for an update on what has been an enormously active period uh, for the Canada Infrastructure Bank over the last few months, and in particular, to share the latest news on the Oneida Energy Storage Project. I'm especially pleased that we're joined today by the Honorable Catherine McKenna, Canada's Minister of Infrastructure and Communities, Aaron Corey, Chief Executive of the Canada Infrastructure Bank, Matt Jamison, President and CEO, Six Nations of the Grand River Development Corporation, and Annette Verschuren, Chair and CEO of NR Store Inc. In just a moment, Minister McKenna will deliver opening remarks. Aaron, Annette, and Matt will follow with brief comments on the Oneida Energy Storage Project. And I'm there then going to be pleased to be moderating a Q&A session with uh, all four of them. J'ai maintenant le plaisir de vous présenter l'honorable Catherine McKenna, Ministre de l'Infrastructure et Collectivité. It's now my true pleasure to introduce the Honorable Catherine McKenna, Canada's Minister of Infrastructure and Communities. Minister, over to you. Uh, well, thanks very much, Mark, and thanks very much to the Council. I, I'm really excited because I'm looking on the right-hand side of my screen and I can see all the 500 people joining in. So, uh, hello to everyone um, from PEI and Ottawa and so many other places. Um, un grand bonjour à tous. I'm coming to you from the traditional territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe peoples. Um, and uh, behind me, uh, I just wanted to point out that we have an Algonquin uh, birch bark canoe, a 20th century canoe. So infrastructure comes in many, many forms. Um, and uh, I am uh, just delighted uh, to be joining you today. Alors, c'était une année très difficile, euh, je sais, pour tout le monde, euh, et on est encore dans la pandémie. C'était une crise sanitaire, mais aussi une crise économique. Mais on va s'en sortir, euh, et après, on doit rebâtir notre économie, et on doit se faire ça d'une manière où on crée des emplois, c'est sûr, mais aussi qu'on bâtit un futur plus propre, euh, et aussi on, on, on travaille ensemble pour des communautés plus inclusives. Um, we've been through a lot together. Uh, I don't need to tell you folks that. Um, in fact, I'm feeling kind of sad because uh, I think otherwise maybe we'd be doing this announcement um, uh, with uh, the, the Six Nations of Grand River um, down the road uh, from my parents' place in Hamilton. So I do promise uh, that I will come uh, visit uh, your community um, Matt uh, and uh, hopefully also see my parents who I know we all miss family members. Um, but look, we are going to get through the pandemic. Um, and uh, as we think about what we want, uh, I think we need to be very focused on outcomes. Um, we need to restart our economy, kickstart it uh, and create jobs. And that's about our competitiveness uh, as a country. Um, we also need to tackle climate change. Uh, we have solutions, including a solution that we're going to talk about today, um, but it's critically important as we drive to net zero, uh, and that's not going to happen by chance. That's going to require thoughtful investments uh, in technology that we know and in opportunities that exist uh, for Canadians, uh, including Indigenous peoples, uh, and uh, that's very exciting to me. Um, and the third thing is we need to build more inclusive communities for all. Uh, that we need to make sure everyone benefits from our investments, um, and that includes Indigenous peoples, but it also includes racialized communities. It also includes people who live in rural areas, um, that these are opportunities all Canadians need to win, and that's certainly a, a great focus of mine. Um, 
And uh, I am very excited uh, to be joining. I would be remiss if I didn't talk about last week. Uh, hopefully many of you noticed that uh, we're making the largest investment in public transit in Ontario's history. Uh, the federal government has committed $12 billion uh, to invest in uh, four lines of uh, the Scar Scarborough Subway Extension, the Young North Subway Extension, the Eglinton West Extension, the Ontario Line, uh, as well as LRT in Hamilton, and in 60 new uh, TCC streetcars, which are going to help keep jobs uh, in Thunder Bay at the Alston plant. Um, so once again, multiple outcomes from jobs to uh, economic growth to climate action uh, to more inclusive communities. Um, I think a lot about climate change. It won't surprise people if you know, uh, coming from my previous portfolio, but uh, the thing is the thing, uh, and we need to tackle climate change, and we, we need to be making smart investments, uh, and we also need to be leveraging private sector dollars. Um, the Canada Infrastructure Bank plays an extremely important role as part of our infrastructure plan, um, and we have uh, excellent uh, leadership, um, Aaron Corey, uh, the, the not so new CEO, I guess Aaron, you're now, you've been there a while, we can't use that anymore, um, who's really delivering uh, on actually getting good projects going forward uh, that benefit uh, all Canadians and um, bringing in the private sector. And that's what we need to be really thinking about. Uh, as I tell folks, there's a limit to uh, government dollars and we have a huge opportunity to partner with the private sector uh, as well as indigenous peoples. Um, this uh, project uh, is part of the, the um, bank's priority in terms of clean power, $5 billion uh, is allocated uh, for the bank to invest in clean power. Um, but it also fits uh, nicely in a new mandate that I have uh, directed the bank to invest a billion dollars in partnership with Indigenous peoples uh, for the benefit of Indigenous peoples. That is extremely important to uh, the Prime Minister. That's extremely important to me. And I think that's extremely important to all Canadians. So I'm not going to say too much about this project because I know we have uh, huge champions here. I know Annette will do an amazing job, one of uh, my good friends um, and someone who is just such a, a leader in Canada in, in really thinking about bringing the future right now um, and looking at innovative opportunities and partnerships. But I'll just say very briefly, the Anita Energy Storage Project in, in Ontario, it hits all these areas that I've talked about, multiple outcomes. Um, one, it's big. I like us thinking big. I didn't talk about that, but in Canada, we need to be ambitious. So this is going to be the largest, one of the largest battery storage uh, projects in North America. We need to be ambitious as a country and be bold. Uh, the opportunities are there. We have smart people. We have folks uh, that uh, can get things done. That is amazing. It is a great partnership. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to hearing Matt Jameson from the Six Nations of Grand River Development Corporation talk about why this is so important to his community and their uh, role in this. Um, it's also going to take 40, it's the equivalent of taking 40,000 cars off the road every year. How awesome is that? Uh, we certainly need to be uh, reducing our emissions. It's going to reduce costs to Ontarians. Who doesn't like saving money? That's also uh, a really um, important opportunity, and it shows the transition to the future. We need to figure out battery storage. Um, this is multiple benefits, and I'm just really proud that it's a made here in Canada solution where we have partnerships across the board, the federal government, the infrastructure bank, the private sector, um, and partners like NR Store and the Six Nations of Grand River Development Corporation. Just keep on bringing projects like this, Aaron Corey. Uh, this, is, uh, this is really awesome. Merci à tous. Right. On that note, sorry, now I realize that you should always read your notes. And uh, I am going to actually follow what I'm supposed to do. Uh, and hand over uh, the virtual mic, sorry, to you, Aaron Corey, who is the CEO of the Canada Infrastructure Bank. Sorry about that, Aaron. <laughs> don't, don't worry. That's the first time you haven't called me the new the new guy. I feel like I've, that means I've, I've run out of that as, a, as an excuse or something. Um, I want to thank Mark for having us today. Thank the council. It is great to be here. And many people on this call, though, of course, I'm a member of the council, so uh, and have enjoyed the work. I want to stay at the start, actually. Um, because I'll, I, I'll I'd be remiss not to mention, Mark, I think this might be your last, if not one of your 
last events in the role. And I just wanted for our entire industry, say a huge thank you to you for your leadership. You've been a great friend to me, a great champion for public private partnership and the idea that together we can get more done. And uh, today's announcement is a great capper to that because some of the themes you've talked about and you've been a leader on at the council over the years have included how do we make the energy transition to clean and certainly a focus on indigenous participation has been a big personal passion of yours. So I just wanted to say thanks from all of us. I know I'm not using the word, you're not retiring. This is a transition because I, I don't, I can't imagine you slowing down much, Mark. So I know you're gonna keep doing portfolios of fun things and uh, we look forward to continuing to see you. But I just wanted to say thanks while I had the floor for a minute because you've been a really incredible leader for our industry. Well, thank you, Aaron. You're being overly generous. Very kind of you. You told me I look good in my tie today, so I felt like I owed you a <laughs> um, I am also coming to you from Toronto. And Mark, as you said at the outset, it is the traditional territory of many nations and is the home today to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. I'd like to acknowledge that as well. I, I was... I'm coming to you from my basement where I've done everything for the last while, it feels like. And as you say, Minister, it would be so nice to be together in person. Although, looking at the scroll, I think it's an amazing, you know, we're always finding the hidden, the hidden, the hidden uh, silver linings, aren't we? And to see the hellos from Treaty from Saskatchewan, Treaty 4 territory, from Montreal, from PEI, it's really cool. And I guess that's the counter to if we were all somewhere eating a luncheon in, in downtown Toronto, we might not have that. Bread. So I suppose there's good the good we can take from that. I'm so excited to be here today to talk about and confirm the CIB's investment of up to $170 million of CIB money in the United Energy Storage Project. This project, it builds on the progress over the past six months, as the minister said. Last fall, the bank uh, published what we call our growth plan. The growth plan was the recognition for the bank that given the uh, world we found ourselves in, the need for economic recovery, the need for real projects that were shovel ready, could happen fast, and could move us forward, achieving both our long term goals around transition in our economy to net zero, better connectivity of Canadians through both transit and broadband, and accelerated economic growth. With those as long term goals, we also had a short term imperative around getting projects done that would aid and spur recovery. So that was six months ago. And I think what for the bank, that was also the recognition that we needed to work at two speeds, we sometimes say, or to think of our investments as a portfolio, as all smart investors do. And for us, that's a portfolio that has to cover the geography of Canada. It needs to cover the sectors that the bank is focused on, as the minister said, whether that's clean power, transit, trade and transportation, broadband. And it also needs to cover time horizons. And for every mega project, the minister talked about the transit investment that the government announced last week. We're also very focused on large transmission projects across the country because those are critical. Those often take a long time to get to an announcement like the minister mentioned from last week. There's a lot of work to go into those. And that's great. We need to do that work. We need to do the groundwork on those long term transformational projects like transmission. But we also need to work in the here and now and get things built that, as I say, spur recovery while moving us towards our long-term goals. So over the last six months, that's really been our focus at the bank. That's why you've seen a series of announcements of investments from us, and today's is no different. Um, we are thrilled because, as the minister said, this project checks every box one could imagine. It is a way to leverage Ontario's existing clean power in new, and in, in new ways that reduce greenhouse gas emissions, that improve economics for Ontarians, that make our grid more resilient, um, these are these are things we should all be proud of, and uh, even even better to be doing it with some Canadian champions. Matt and Annette, I just want to say you and your teams, and I'll turn it over to you to speak. But you and your teams have been absolute champions for uh, the kind of innovative partnership that the CIB was created to foster. This idea that we'll get more built if the we use new tools beyond traditional the traditional divide of Private entrepreneurs do innovative stuff. Government does hard, old school, government funded infrastructure projects and the two don't meet. And there's a slice in the middle that the CIB was created to find, which is projects that are 
that are have economic value to them, that have private sector leadership to them, but that have technological or commercial risks that the bank can help bridge by being a long-term stable partner to you to, to make them happen. So we're really thrilled. We're thrilled to have both of you as partners and, uh, and really excited to be at this point today where we can commit and uh, announce the terms of our investment and move forward with you on a project that very soon will be into contracting, construction, and eventually operation, which is, of course, what we all aspire to. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Annette to say a few words and really just say again how, uh, how what a pleasure it is for us to have reached this milestone. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mark. Um, uh, look, I'm uh, absolutely delighted to be here today. And our store started in 2012 as a startup, right? And uh, we have uh, found, uh, we've built energy storage projects. We have uh, uh, saw, we have, we have tested and seen the opportunity associated with storage. I learned about storage when I was running Home Depot. And when I set up the supply chain, right, I saw the impact and efficiency of storage uh, in that business. It, you know, it decreased cost, increased, increased ability to fill those shelves, et cetera. Same thing with electrons. The, the opportunity here in terms of energy storage, uh, really uh, accelerating, making the grid more resistant, uh, uh, resilient, uh, it's just really, really exciting. We've got flywheel facilities, compressed air facilities we help build with HydroStore. And, uh, but this is a big and exciting project. This will be uh, uh, the biggest uh, project in North America, and we'll probably build it faster than anybody else will. So we may be the biggest project in the world, I'd say. Um, but look, uh, you know, NR Store's experience with the technologies, NR Store's uh, relationship with working with the ISO, they've been terrific in innovation and really have helped us understand uh, and work with, uh, you know, hybrids, uh, with, uh, with uh, you know, uh, really interesting ways in which we can maximize the performance of storage. But um, look, the modernization of the grid is important. Um, the, the, we really need to move move fast and hard. Uh, climate change is a real issue. And one thing this pandemic has done, I think, has really made us understand the importance of this. And, you know, I'm thrilled to be the chair of STTC, thrilled to be the chair of Mars. I'm seeing the innovation happening across Canada. Um, and uh, But this project, this project is special. And it's particularly special because of my partner that I'm going to introduce in a minute. Three years ago, Matt and I, uh, we signed a uh, an NDA and we work, my team members had worked with Matt in the past. And so we knew all about his talent, knew all about the Six Nations uh, growth, their understanding and, uh, you know, uh, of renewable energy. And we presented this idea to Matt. And we have been at the table from that day forward. Every major decision is done with Matt. We're 50-50 partners. We really understand uh, the opportunities here, understand this relationship, um, and really, really excited about uh, about going forward. Look, um, we I want to I want to say to um, to CIB, this is the perfect project for you because you fit in where we couldn't get traditional financing. Um, but it allows the financial community to get involved in a project like this. Um, and so it's really smart public money, maximizing and leveraging more money. So I think uh, just fabulous. So I want to say to Aaron, to Sashin, oh my God, the team, uh, Minister McKenna, I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. I want to say thank you to Minister Rickford and his team for supporting this and encouraging us. This has been a long process. This is a big, bold, gutsy move. Uh, and and uh, and the country's ready for it, Minister, really is ready for it. And so we're really excited about moving forward, really excited about this partnership. I wanna call out Chief Mark Hill, who got this council improvement and, and, and you know, the, the relationship we have with Six Nations is fantastic and so critical uh, for our future. Uh, I believe uh, electricity energy uh, is is a real partnership that we can make with the indigenous communities across the country. We need to do this, um, uh, and it's really exciting. And we have 
as much to learn from the indigenous community as they have to learn from us. And I've learned more from Matt Jameson in the last three years than I've learned from uh, any most other people that I know. So I am thrilled to introduce this amazing partner of ours, this amazing, amazing leader, smart as a whip and, uh, and, and passionate and, uh, and determined. And so over to you, Matt. Well, geez, thank you, Annette. And I don't know how, how I'm going to live up to the expectations after that, uh, after that warm intro. Uh, you know, first of all, I want to say thanks to Mr. McKenna, uh, Aaron, um, Mark, and then, of course, my good friend, Annette. And she's right. This has been a labor of, of love for many years. Um, just to give, just, I just want to share a little bit of background about Six Nations. Uh, Six Nations of the Grand River is a Haudenosaunee community. Uh, we are the largest by population in the country. And we're, just lo we're located just west of the GTA. Despite our proximity, we uh, face a tremendous infrastructure gap here in our community. And, you know, part of the challenge for us is to, you know, find ways in which uh, we can, you know, facilitate the future that we choose. And the mission of the Development Corporation is to achieve economic self-sufficiency without compromising our values. You know, and as we created this institution, we've done our part, I think. Um, we've gotten organized. We've built good governance systems good accountability for the things that we do. And we've, uh, we've prepared ourselves and opened ourselves for business. Uh, part of our responsibility as a development corporation and as a community is to, is to get engaged, to understand the issues, to get knowledgeable so that we can help shape the future. This is an obligation that we have for our future generations. And part of what we do now is challenge the status quo by pursuing innovation and opportunity to do things differently because not just because they've been done that way in the past, but how do we find ways to unlock efficiencies and solutions, not just for ourselves, but for others? In other words, how do we put our fingerprints on our own future? And that's really the challenge that we have every day. And it really, it's a challenge that I love. And it's, a, it's something I've got a wonderful team working with me uh, who've helped support the strategy. And you know, we've, we're very focused in terms of where we, where we want to go. And, and part of our strategy, of course, is in the energy space, and we're a fairly heavily investor, heavily invested in that space. Uh, and in order to progress down that path, we do have a strategic uh, plan, of course. And one of those strategic pillars is to identify the absolute best partners that we can that we can find in the marketplace. We want to partner with the best, because at the end of the day, we want to learn from the knowledge of our partners and benefit from the experience of others, frankly, to help find a development path that's efficient, affordable, and, and valuable. Um, Enterstore checks all those boxes. They're a boutique firm uh, with a proven track record of a highly talented team. I mean, I'm, every time I'm on the phone with them, which is seemingly every day, uh, I'm continually you know, impressed with Annette's team uh, and you know, how focused and talented they are. They get it, they understand it, and there's a common theme to our dialogue, which is how do we ensure that indigenous communities and interests are top of mind in the, in the decisions that we make? And for me, that's impressive. Uh, it's refreshing, frankly. Uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, Six Nations is a significant investor in renewables. We have, uh, frankly, a vested interest in building a grid that's much more efficient to capture and unlock the value of the renewable energy assets that we've already invested in. You know, we know firsthand, and I, and I can tell you firsthand, what the impact is of curtailment on the production of renewables in the market space and what and what that does to the reputation of renewable assets now because we aren't able to harness the value that's there and you know frankly when we build efficiencies into the grid as an investor and an owner of renewable energy assets uh, it's an, it's in our vested interest to have uh, a more efficient grid to maximize the potential of those assets because when those power purchase agreements come up for renewal, we want to have a grid that can fully accept and realize the value of those existing, uh, you know, grid connected assets. Uh, and so, you know, the, that's where the United Energy Storage Project really comes in for us. We're investing our own capital alongside Enterstore team. We're putting the capacity and the resources to serve up an innovative solution, a big solution to a big problem, this complex problem we face in the grid right now, which is this inefficiency. And, and for us, inefficiency and unlocking that inefficiency means mitigating further disruption to the environment by building new assets when we already have assets that aren't optimized and they're in terms of their function. And you know what, for us to unlock the value of sustainable clean energy and make way for a more affordable grid really is in keeping with our strategy 
to do what's right for our future generations, to make sure that we embrace the opportunity and not just talk about it, but bring forward a solution. And, and you know, and clearly in closing, you know, my last comment here is you know, with respect to the CIB team, you know, Annette nailed it in her comments, you know, from a, both an advisory and, uh, and a financial advisory and planning perspective, I'm blown away uh, with, with the level of aptitude that the team at the CIB session and company have. Um, you know, I, I can see that, the, that this group of folks have, are committed, passionate about what they do. They've bought into the business model and they're actively trying to find or engineer solutions to the challenges that we have. The project itself checks all the boxes. We need CIB at the table in order to bring other private and institutional capital to the table, which I think we are have already done. We're there now. We just need to, we need to close a few loose ends with, with the province of Ontario, but I believe we're going to be there in very short order. And at the very end, when it's all said and done, at the least of which I can say is that, you know, we've worked together to demonstrate a future path forward in the public private space that's inclusive of Indigenous partners and how we can work together to create meaningful solutions. So thank you. And I look forward to the discussion today. Thanks. Mark, I'll turn it back to you. For really great um, scene setting remarks. Hopefully you can all hear me. Um, <laughs> great, thanks. Um, so uh, we're gonna drill down a little bit uh, more on this project in just a couple of moments, but I thought uh, for this Q&A session, we might uh, start with you, Aaron. Um, as, as you would know, the CIB is working now on six projects in the clean power sector, and the Oneida investment quickly follows, of course, your Lake Erie connector announcement just a short while ago. Can you tell us a bit more about the CIB's involvement in the clean power sector, and more specifically, I guess, how the Oneida project has moved forward uh, with the bank? Sure, Mark. Um, you're absolutely right that, you know, the, the minister mentioned our ambition to invest in clean power. Um, we plan on deploying at least $5 billion of our $35 billion in that space. But it's worth coming back to um, something else the minister said. She and I have a competition going, who gets to say the word outcomes first? I mean, we do a lot of speaking and it's kind of a battle, you know, she got to it before me. But, but here's the thing, infrastructure is lots of stuff. You know, it's, it's physical, it's buildings, it's bridges, it's transit lines, it's pieces of wire, but it's not really any of those things. Infrastructure ultimately is about the economy we're building, the society we're trying to build, and it's the stuff that glues that together. We're 100% focused on the bank on outcomes. And the government, the, the way that the CIB was set up, the government tells us, here are the outcomes we want you to focus on. And they're the outcome, by the way, government has lost, we're just one slice, we're one tool in the toolkit, and we're focused on outcomes that have this feature of being in the world of economic, right? So we're not building schools where, you know, we're focused on the economic slice of infrastructure and getting outcomes in those. And the outcomes are simple reduce greenhouse gas emissions and make our economy transition to our long-term goals around net zero, number one. Number two, connect Canada through both transit and broadband. Number three, grow an economy through better trade corridors, through investments like our investment in irrigation infrastructure in Alberta to grow our food supply. Um, and of course, underlying all of that, there's two things, as the minister said. One is in benefit to participation of Indigenous communities. Number two, create jobs and growth in the short term through the building of infrastructure, right? So that's my framework. And if I give you that framework, it gets obvious why a project like this is so important to us, because it does hit on multiple of those outcomes. Doing this project well, doing the Lake Erie, look at the Lake Erie Connector, you mentioned it, but it's another example of this. It's a chance to uh, leverage Ontario's existing green and clean power generation. It's good for the economy. It reduces greenhouse gases. In the case of Lake Erie, the more of that's in the States, actually. That's okay. Greenhouse gases don't know a border. It's really important still to achieving our collective goals towards greenhouse gas emission. And it's economically really smart. It benefits Ontarians by taking our resource, which is clean power, and avoiding curtailment, as Matt said, and avoiding selling it for little or no return. So it's Clean power, to answer your question in short, clean power is the perfect space for us because it helps us check off multiple of our outcomes boxes. 
It is beautifully positioned for CIB investment. There are some projects, by the way, in the energy space, you don't need us. Renewable power generators in some, mature, you know, the, the, the price of solar solar coming to where it is, you know, the, the, there's no, and that's great because we're all for the private sector solution where it makes sense. But there are bridges in, as I say, closing technological and commercial gaps where on a project like this one, the CIB can be that uh, bridge. And uh, so that's why we're here. And you can uh, you can bet there's lots more, Mark, uh, those six. I talked about the two recently, but there are other transmission projects, district energy, renewables projects that we're in the, we're in the assessment phase on. There will be more to come because it is such a great space for the CIB in the way it helps us achieve those outcomes. Well, you're wetting appetites there, Mr. Corey, so that's good to know. Thank you very much for your, your comments there. Maybe I can turn to you, Annette. Um, you and I have a long-standing relationship. I know you are a longtime advocate of cost-effective clean energy projects that create, you know, obviously cost savings and reduce greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions. That's been a passion of yours for some time. So can you tell us a little bit more about uh, the Oneida project and why uh, NR Store is investing in energy storage and some of the benefits you believe you'll achieve through this initiative? Oh, it's a great question. Thanks, Mark. Look, the Oneida project really uh, is going to take that excess wind that we produce at night, store it, and put it on the grid when it's needed. It is going to, um, you know, uh, make the, uh, the t t t improve the capacity market, improve our ability to, uh, to do frequency regulation, all kinds of services. The neat thing about energy storage is that it it can do a lot of things, right? And so, um, and so the ability to for the ISO to have this tool to maneuver electrons and store them and release them when they need to is. It's 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 really going to modernize the grid. It's really going to take it to the next level. Across the country, Mark, there are people, there are provinces that need to get off coal faster. There are in order for us to meet the Paris Agreement, and I see energy storage, battery storage installation, particularly which is economic now, to be a great bridge, a great bridge to help provinces uh, to get to 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 accelerate that. Uh, neat thing about this project, it's shovel ready. Uh, it will create jobs immediately, uh, big construction jobs, big opportunity. Uh, it's, it'll be built in 24 months, so we're going to be able to operate it quickly. So, you know, this issue of how do we get, how do we take, how do we move to that low carbon economy quickly? This is a wonderful tool to do it across the country. And, and you know, microgrids in the north is another area that Enerstore is really involved with and, and really supporting. We need uh, to do lots of this work. Um, it is really uh, very, very exciting to see the opportunities that we that we have here, Mark. And like I say, energy storage is a little bit like bacon. It goes with everything. You can put it in a house, and it can it can you can save your 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 uh, your renewable energy. You can put it in a in a high energy industry area, and it can peak, reduce your peaks. It can go on the grid and really make a very big difference in making the distribution of electrons. We need to stop curtailing our renewable energy across our country. We need to maximize the performance of that. Um, this technology really uh, accelerates that, so that we can that we can eventually export uh, a lot more of this uh, good and exciting uh, uh, electricity energy that we have, this renewable energy. So, it is. This is the 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 world's our oyster uh, as we expand here, and it's this is important for for everybody and everything across the country. So, that's why I love this and. I just want to make one more comment. I have the most, I have the, one of the smartest and, 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 and groups of people with the greatest hearts and uh, determination. And my success has always been uh, surrounding myself with people that are way smarter than me. And uh, I just want to call them out uh, as, as, uh, as my friend Matt did. They're fabulous. And that's how this talent that we have in our country, this talent that we have in our teams are really going to make this execution really go fast and efficiently. Thanks, Annette. You covered a lot of ground there. Uh, and once you get passion for what you do, you're going to be quite a person. 
Uh, but it's, <laughs> thank you for that, really. <laughs> Let's turn to you, Matt, for just a moment. You're CEO of Six Nations of the Grand River Development Corporation. And in that capacity, you're managing economic interests of the Six, Nation, Six Nations community on a number of renewable energy projects, right? I mean, I think uh, you've got uh, participating in construction of over $2.4 billion dollars of infrastructure assets. So this is a pretty substantive organization. So tell us a bit more about what drew you to NR Store and the Oneida project. And how does that this project in particular align with your own uh, partnership model? Okay, great. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate the question. Um, you know, first of all, Development Corporation, the Six Nations Development Corporation is a wholly owned subsidiary of the Six Nations Council. Uh, we are an, effectively the economic arm for the community, and we are we function very much like a private equity or an asset management firm. We have diversified holdings uh, spread across a number of industries. Of course, renewable energy is one of them, but we also have business interests uh, within the community, within the territory of Six Nations, and hospitality and tourism, and other things that we're charged with. And then, of course, you know, building a portfolio of assets to produce economic impact is is first and foremost 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 in our minds in, in terms of priority. So as I, as I said earlier in my remarks, you know, our partnership strategy is to seek out and partner with the best companies. Uh, and, you know, as we do that, there's typically an asset test that we go through. And, and, you know, that asset test is, you know, do we need this company more than this company needs us? You know, gone are the days where uh, companies can come to Six Nations and, and want to strike a, a bargain, if you want to call it that, to access funding uh, and almost, you know, sort of wash over what the real what the real objectives are by utilizing the indigenous lens. Uh, those days are gone. Uh, and, you know, for us, it's about, you know, frankly, what's the ESG focus of our partner? Uh, the environmental aspect of things for us is, is paramount and non-negotiable. And uh, as part of our partnership screening process, uh, those partners need to need to need to meet that standard and meet that test of expectations around doing what's right, what's sustainable and what's just, frankly. Uh, you know, and um, as a company, you know, we've been very successful since 2015. We're fairly young uh, and, you know, we have been growing in terms of our of our interest and capability to execute projects. And, and, and you know, with Enter Store, uh, we saw an opportunity, of course, with a company that checked all the boxes, but a way in which we could take calculated risk to take on more ownership position, in this case, a 50-50, a development role with, with Enter Store. And that, you know, as we go through this cycle, find ways in which we can, you know, fully, fully assess the risk involved and potentially put additional financial resources and commitments into the project as an, as an investor. Uh, so that really is a sort of a, a, we're really in the middle of a paradigm shift, I think, Mark. You know, we started out as a fairly, as a new company in 2015. We had fairly, you know, calculated risks in terms of space, uh, entry into the renewable energy space. Now we understand that market. We understand the dilemma. Now we see an opportunity with a company like Enterstar, who's got the expertise that we can learn from. And now we can take a little bit a little bit more calculated risk in terms of how we want to expand our presence that, in, in that space. But look, you know, uh, in the renewable energy space, as I mentioned earlier, we're, uh, we're, an owner, we're an owner in that space. We participate in almost 900 megawatts of renewable energy projects in the region. So we have that vested interest I talked about to harness this energy and utilize it at a time when the grid needs it. So that we build efficiencies and save ratepayer funds, but also we enhance the marketability and the perception of renewable energy in the marketplace. There's been a, a number of years where, you know, renewable energy has gotten this bad, bad rap just because of the inefficiencies in the grid. There's a lot of private capital, institutional capital at work right now, today, in the wind farms and solar farms that we have around our community that's already deployed. And all we need is the ingredient to unlock those inefficiencies. And that's where the United Battery Storage Project comes in. That's why we're drawn to it, because as an investor in renewables, this is just a logical, common sense, next step approach. And then we need these tools, and we need many types of tools in the marketplace to unlock this opportunity. And we're just proud to be part of participating with the company like Interstore, with the assistance of the CIB, to play our part, to do our, to do our thing, and hopefully unlock those opportunities for other developers, and perhaps who knows, another Oneida battery storage facility somewhere in the region would be great. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. That's such a great story you're telling, really, about how a partnership is really critical to advancing an agenda, irrespective of what the priority is. And 
and to actually bring an institution like the bank into play because they're being asked to do exactly what their mandate uh, tells them they should be doing, right? Making a difference. So this is a wonderful story uh, from that perspective. And that's a personal observation, obviously. Um, if I could turn to you, Minister McKenna, for just a moment. I mean, we all know you as a longtime passionate environmental um, list, environmentalist, and of course, in your capacity as Minister of Infrastructure and Communities. The United Project must really hit many of the government's key uh, markers in terms of the vision for infrastructure investment, innovation, clean tech, and carbon, and new partnership models right, for economic growth. Can you tell uh, the audience uh, a bit about why the CIB is critical to bringing in the private sector to get more infrastructure built? Uh, yeah, well, thanks, Mark. And it's actually funny because I'm seeing these comments. Uh, I see, hi, John Beck, number one. Uh, Andy, uh, I did meet with uh, Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg uh, today. Um, and actually, that's not unrelated to my answer. Look, I mean, the bottom line is, uh, we need to build more and better infrastructure. We have a huge infrastructure deficit in our country and in indigenous communities, and you've heard that um, from Matt. Um, and we have a huge economic opportunity. Um, I mean, I'm an environmentalist, but I'm just a practical person who understands where the future is going and knows where the good jobs and the economic opportunity are and, and the advantages for Canada. And so we, we need to, I mean, Mark Carney has talked about the quantum. Uh, it's like a, we, we need trillions, like maybe $30 trillion uh, for the economy of the future. And so it's all hands on deck. And why would we not bring in private institutional capital? Um, it's there, um, but they need good projects. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's great to see that we're getting um, stuff done. Sometimes I replace stuff with something else, but you know, this is what it's, uh, it's about. <laughs> Um, and the bank is really stepping up because they are a critical partner. They're not the only piece of the puzzle, for sure, on our investments in infrastructure. And what's interesting is people are, are paying attention. So uh, when I had my call with Secretary Pete today, he was talking about, obviously, they have a massive infrastructure bill. And just so we are ambitious, I want everyone to know that if you adjust for our uh, population, we are investing as much as they are hoping to get. Um, in, in infrastructure and we're getting projects done and moving forward and getting them built. I mean, infrastructure doesn't happen overnight, but we've been extremely focused. I've been extremely focused, just get projects done, get them out the door um, and move forward. Anyway, he, um, he was saying that they're looking at an infrastructure bank. Now he has said that they, in the US, they have been looking at an infrastructure bank for a long time, but his point is the same as mine. Like it's not in the same as Aaron's and, and I mean, everyone I'm sure who would agree that Look, we, we need more money. There's a limit to private to uh, to taxpayer dollars. Um, we also need innovative financing models. We can benefit from that, um, and, uh, and and there's real opportunities. Um, so we'll see what happens in the U.S. The Department of Transportation actually does some innovative things. Um, so to Andy, um, we did talk about things like bundling and how do you get things going quickly and and how do you finance things in different ways. Um, but this is, uh, I mean, it's, it's really critical. Uh, we need to work in partnership. I've always said that. You need unusual partners at the table. I wouldn't say this is so unusual. It's only so unusual because we haven't done enough of it, but it shouldn't be unusual. Um, and when I listen to you, Matt, like you guys are really thinking innovatively about what you want for your community, what you want for your future, how you want to own your own future, and you want to be part of the transition to uh, to net zero. Like that is awesome. Um, as I say, I can't wait to come visit you folks when I um, am able to to leave Ottawa. And uh, and Annette, I mean, you've been a champion uh, for so long on looking at what are the opportunities in the clean economy. Um, and uh, and then we have the bank as an innovative financing tool, and you have the federal government who said, yeah, we're going to get to net zero by 2050. We're going to create a million jobs. We're going to ensure a better quality of life for all and communities all over the country uh, with in partnership with Indigenous uh, peoples, and that's a great thing. The UK also is looking at our model too. Uh, everyone, you know, has an opportunity to learn from each other, um, and so I think that. Um, this is, you know, an example of how you can move forward and, and uh, I'll, I'll say outcomes. It's like drink when you say outcomes or something, but uh, to get multiple outcomes, but also to get maximum benefit for every dollar that, the, that comes from uh, government. We need to do that. 
Um, so I'm just, I, you know what, it's amazing when I hear of these projects, because sometimes people are like, what are you guys doing? You know, is it important? Does it matter? You can see right here, it does matter, that we are thinking big, um, that we are moving forward, that we're getting things done, and we're doing it to the benefit of all Canadians, which at the end of the day, um, infrastructure is a is kind of a boring, bureaucratic, made-up word. Uh, it's about, um, you know, investing and in, in building now the future we want. So that is what we are doing today. So hopefully everyone's excited uh, and keep the comments going. It's quite good to see uh, everyone's input. Yeah, thank you, Minister. And, and thanks again for making reference to your discussion today with uh, Secretary Pete. Um, you know, um, uh, I, I know you realize this, but Canada is recognized globally um, for our commitment to investing in infrastructure and the outcomes that we're achieving. I mean, that's we should take real pride in that. And I know that um, Secretary Pete, um, if he gets really honest with you, will say, we can learn a lot from Canada. And uh, He said that, by the way, you can all tweet it. He said that, we can learn a lot. I said, we can learn a lot from the US too. Absolutely, absolutely that. And as you mentioned, you know, the UK and their infrastructure bank, they're looking at, at this infrastructure bank to help them out. So. Um, you know, there's opportunity there for global uh, collaboration, which will really advance a grander infrastructure agenda. Sorry, these are, you know, platforms of mine that I've had for a long time. <laughs> but well, I think you earned it. This is one of your last events. You can say whatever you want. <laughs> it's very kind of you. I guess I really have to leave now. Uh, okay, back to Aaron Corey for a moment, because you did talk about um, private capital, attracting private capital. And that is really significant, particularly when we talk about uh, opportunities with Indigenous communities. And you mentioned that there'll be more that we can expect to hear from you over the next little while. So um, can you talk about the opportunities that you think exist now for the bank and how you can play a major role in in, in that play, in that space? Sure, Mark. I, I'll, I can touch on, there's a few questions in the chat as well around the financial structure and the role we're playing. So just to, to recap, uh, the CIB, for. This is a pretty sophisticated group, I know, but just the, the, to be clear, the CIB has the ability and the flexibility to play anywhere in the capital stack of a project. We can lend money as debt. We can also invest in something that looks more equity-like, meaning where we're sharing an upside and also downside. That's what the bank was created to do. And our job on every project is to figure out how to make taxpayers' money go furthest, i.e. how we put in the least amount of our money to make a project go. And that's not a precise science, obviously, but that's what we're conceptually trying to do in every project. In this one, we have great equity in, like, they're on the two, I don't know if everyone's screen looks like that, they're on my right and my left. These are our equity developers. They're both, um, have done an incredible job of getting the project to this chart, this point, but also to raising the true, the, the capital that makes our world go, which is at-risk equity, the entrepreneurial juice of Canada. The bank in this case is providing a loan. It's low cost, it's stable, it's in the amount of $170 million. And to put it in scale without being too precise on the numbers, but this is, we're talking about in the order of a project that's about a half a billion dollars, give or take. So our investment is somewhere 30 to 35% if you, if you think of it that way. And we're making a loan to the project. The gap we're filling, and Annette, and Annette as the developer can speak to this more eloquently than I, but there's certainly with a project of this scale, there are, what's interesting about it, first of all, it's an interesting mix of, of regulated and merchant asset. And that happens over, so, that, so part of this will be contracted, part of it will be merchant. So that has a risk profile to it that the market can absorb quite a bit of, and that's exciting, it has upside to it, but maybe not all of. So we can be, by being low cost, stable, long-term investors. I, I, I keep saying to people, the role of the CAB is not really to provide cheap capital. Actually, money is plentiful and lots of people will lend you money for not that much. It's that we'll be, lo not, we'll be low cost, stable, patient, risk sharing capital that allows a project to go. So that's what we're doing in this case through our loan. And that's the gap we're filling is to help bridge that adoption, bridge the economics to making sure they work. As Annette said, the, this project actually will save Ontario ratepayers, and that's that's the, the whole concept by capturing our power when it's surplus and selling it afterwards. But there's uncertainty around that. And so that's some of what the CID is sharing. Great. To answer your question more broadly, Mark, if I could, look, this is what we're doing on every project, trying to size our involvement to make sure we're leveraging our money as far as we can. 
And on every project, it's a little different. People often ask me, well, is it four to one, two to one? What's the ratio? The answer is it, it's exactly how much each project can bear. Um, our goal on each project is to figure out what's the minimum amount of, of bank investment. But to put some numbers to it in the aggregate, just for a picture, by the time we get to the end of our current quarter, um, say by Canada Day of this year, let me give you a snapshot of where the CIB is or will be cumulatively. We'll have invested, signed firm commitments to invest about 3.8 billion of the CIB's capital. That starts with the REM project in Montreal when the bank was conceived all the way up till today. That's about how much of our money will have deployed. And the total project value that that 3.8 billion is part is about $12 billion of infrastructure. Now, there's about $2 billion in there that is other levels of government or other, I'll call them other public sources of funding, but that leaves about 6 billion that is true private and institutional capital, like Annette and Matt and their colleagues from companies big and small. So that's that's the pace at which we're working. And as I say, each project we look at on its merits, but that's kind of how the math is working out for the CIB right now. Thanks, Aaron, that's really helpful. Those numbers are pretty compelling. Um, can I come back to you for a moment, Minister? I know that um, you've been very focused over the last little while on uh, the first uh, national infrastructure assessment um, that, that you are shepherding. And um, given that we have such a large and diverse audience, I thought this would be just a wonderful opportunity for you to tell us a little bit more about what uh, you're hoping, uh, again, I'll use the word outcomes this time, uh, what the outcomes are that you're hoping for from the study and how it ties with, again, building back better. Uh, that is such a focus of the government at the moment. Well, I hope this audience is like isn't like a, some other you know, regular people who might be like national infrastructure assessment. Put me to sleep right away. Um, <laughs> it's super important. What we we really need to be focused um, in getting big things built in this country. Um, it is challenging, um, and of course, there's politics and infrastructure. But I, I think we need to try to take the politics out of infrastructure. Be very disciplined. I've talked about taxpayer dollars, but you know the private sector wants to know there's a pipeline of projects. They want to have some certainty. They don't want to see lurching. I don't want to see lurching. Um, and, and gosh, if we're going to get outcomes um, like hitting net zero by 2050, that's not going to happen by chance. And I say that as a former environment minister, minister of environment and climate change, where I literally spent every day trying to figure out how to get emissions uh, reduced in, in every single sector. So. Um, it's really important, and I, I'm encouraging every single person. So, Chris, Karen, uh, John, back, you better do it. Um, but you guys have to weigh in. This is about how do we build the future we want, and uh, it's uh, it's also a lesson learned from the UK. The UK did a national infrastructure assessment. It's a process, so it is not just like you just do this and you're like, great, static, done. We're uh, no, you you. You sit down and you figure out, um, We I framed it in three questions. I, I work in threes, as people <laughs> have lo quickly learned. Um, one, uh, what is it that we want to build? So we put out um, uh, the classes or the, the categories of infrastructure that I think are really important, but we need to have a discussion about that. Like these, are we getting it right? What is in, like, what are the areas? I don't think it's just roads, bridges, um, uh, ports and airports, of course it's that, um, but it's also broadband. Geez, if we don't think broadband's important, we've been missing it, the plot, because you can't even participate in this if you don't have good broadband. Um, but it's, it's you know, natural infrastructure. There are a whole range of different things that we don't necessarily think about as infrastructure, but are really critical to the future we want. So we want to hear from Canadians on that. Number two, it's not just the federal government. Often people are like, that federal government, do you know how much infrastructure, public infrastructure we own? Tiny, tiny bit. We need all levels of government to be working together. Also, there's private infrastructure. There are different, so we need to have a conversation about how do we get our, our act together. So levels of government, but also uh, infrastructure owners and funders, they, they were all clear. What were we trying to do? Because by the way, there's a big world. So not everyone wakes up every day uh, and talks about Canada. I know it's sad, but <laughs> I lived in Asia. They don't do that, um, and we're gonna we're gonna have to compete. Um, and uh, a lot of folks are are competing uh, in, in this space. And I'm very ambitious for our country, but I think that once again to the discipline piece. And then the third thing is really important: how are we gonna pay for it? I'm a mom; got to pay my bills at the end of the month. Like you know, I get this list. Everyone comes to me. I would like to build all this. Okay, great. 
all right, let me add it up for you. And then we have to have a real conversation about what our priorities are and how are we going to do that. Um, interestingly, in the UK, um, and I'm not saying I'm not prejudging anything, but, uh, you know, and, and, and this wouldn't be at this point. I think that we've got to get to the point. We're at the beginning of the beginning. Have a conversation. I do think, and I'm flagging this personally, Catherine McKenna, as a person, I think we need to get to the point where we have an independent body that does the actual assessment. Because it's not just the federal government, it shouldn't be political, it should be an independent body that provides advice, government can take advice or not. Um, but in the UK, they came up with a percentage of GDP that is just, it's invested perpetually forever, um, in perpetuity is the word I'm looking for, um, in infrastructure. And uh, I think we should get to that point. We, we did this for transit, so if you paid attention, uh, permanent public transit funding, these are long, large, long-scale investments, and people need a line of sight on that. But we have to have a conversation. So I hope I've made it exciting for you because it's about outcomes. I'll come back to outcomes. Jobs, jobs, jobs. Uh, that Mayor Pete does that, but I'm going to be Mayor Pete. Jobs, jobs, jobs. We need jobs. Uh, growth. We need. We are going to need growth. Um, we're in the largest recession since the Great Depression. We're investing in Canadians, but we are going to need growth. Um, competitiveness. One bucket. Two. Uh, more inclusive communities where we have economic opportunities and benefits to all. And we've got an amazing partner here, uh, Matt Jamison um, from the Six Nations of Grand River. But you know there are many opportunities like this, and we have to be creative and thoughtful uh, about that and tackle our infrastructure deficit, which we know exists in indigenous communities, but in a whole range of communities. And three, climate, 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 the thing is the thing. The thing is climate change. It is real, it is a huge threat, and it's a huge opportunity. And so uh, I think this is a way we can have a line of sight on how do we get big things built? Um, how do we build the future we want? And how do we make sure that we are net zero by 2050? Because that is much bigger than that. It was about like our kids and grandkids and seven generations and whether we even have a sustainable planet. So um, you can't really put a value on that one. Um, but that, so everyone now go to the website. If you Google the Canada National Infrastructure Assessment, please weigh in. We do want to hear from all Canadians uh, about this. I can tell you, Minister, I was looking for closing remarks. I think you summed it up actually very effectively. Uh, so thank you for that. And I know it's difficult to both be speaking and keep an eye on the comments that are being made along the way, but we're getting very strong supportive comments from everybody. And uh, this is a, a huge mix of players, right? From those that are well known and others that uh, are looking to become well known. So um, I without uh, trying to be overly psychophantic, you're really uh, striking uh, the important chords and, and this is what people have on mind, in mind rather. So uh, again, thank you for those remarks. I'll take those as closing remarks for all. Um, I know that we're right at the point of ending this event and there is a media event after this one. So um, we'll turn to that. Let me just finish off by saying thank you again, all of you minister. It's wonderful to have you with us today, Aaron, uh, Annette, Matt, great to have you here. This really is a wonderful project. And quite frankly, I think it becomes a bit of a poster child uh, for a whole range of other projects. Uh, and if we can emulate this one uh, over and over again, boy, will we have seen our yardsticks uh, march forward. So thank you again for that. I'm delighted that we've had such a large group of people uh, sign on for today's session. Again, a reflection of how important this initiative is and the work that the bank is doing. And I know that many people have asked whether or not a recording of this session will be available. It is available and should be posted within the next two or three hours. And you can use the link that you use to log on today to get access to that recording. So thank you all again uh, for finding time to join us today. Merci à tous, euh, Madame le Ministre, encore une fois. C'était un grand plaisir de travailler avec vous, comme toujours. It's really wonderful to have you with us today. And thank you all. And um, I, I can't imagine a, a better event uh, for my sayonara uh, with the CIB than to have done this one today. Thank you all again, and I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thanks, Mark. Thank you.
Good afternoon. Uh, we're just going to begin the media scrum portion of this event. Um, if any media who are in the audience could please identify yourselves in the chat group uh, at the side of your screen. Uh, we'll just wait a bit for you to please identify yourselves and then uh, we'll move on to the Q&A portion of this event. Thank you. Just another reminder and call, if there are any media present who uh, wish to be uh, part of the Q&A and the Scrum with the, uh, with the presenters, please identify yourselves in the chat and, uh, and we will open up for a Scrum. Otherwise, we'll be finishing the event. Thank you. Last call for media for questions. If there are any media, please identify yourself in the chat. Otherwise, we'll be ending the event in the next few minutes. Thank you. Last call. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Have yourself a lovely day. Thanks, Andrew.